There's this pretty incredible new podcast on right now called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill. My wife and I, we are both listening to this podcast very eagerly. I think they have about four episodes out to this particular moment, and I highly recommend it if you have a podcasting app on your phone or your computer, whatever, of course you do. Go check out The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, an incredibly interesting uh, narrative, kind of a re telling of the story of Mars Hill and its pastor Mark Driscoll along with a lot of analysis about how it grew so fast and why it fell so terribly. This podcast is done by a host called Mike Cosper and it's uh, promoted or uh, produced by Christianity Today. So it's very well done. A lot of audio clips, a um, lot of commentary, a lot of interviews with people who were there, who were actually part of the whole story. If you're not familiar with Mark Driscoll, and it, it strikes me that not everybody is, uh, I was talking to one of my staffers the other day and telling him, hey, are you listening to the uh, the rise and fall of Mars Hill? He's like, who's Mark Driscoll? Because he's <laughs> 10 to 12 years younger than I am. I'm 45 years old uh, or thereabouts. And this younger staffer had never even heard of Mark Driscoll. I'm thinking to myself, how is this possible? Seems like everybody knows the story of Mars Hill and Mark Driscoll, but no. So if you don't know, um, more than a decade ago, all the way back to the early 2000s, Mark Driscoll was the pastor of the, one of the fastest growing churches in America, planted in Seattle, the least church city in America, as Driscoll always reminded you. Um, he was not of any particular denomination. He was uh, kind of a firebrand. He later cast himself as a, a Calvinist and he preached a very hard, bold, brash, aggressive form of masculine Christianity. And it worked in a city of all kinds of liberals and feminists and progressives. People flocked to Mars Hill. They grew tremendously. They planted churches all over the place. I think they had 15,000 people or something like that in their heyday. And then the whole thing collapsed like a house of cards. And normally when you hear a story of somebody who rises to the heights of Christian popularity and fame, as dangerous as that is, and we've spoken about that a number of times on this channel, normally when they fall, it has to do with one of two things. Either they fall because of money or they fall because of sex. And Driscoll's case is very interesting because neither of those things seem to be the problem. In fact, there's not a hint anywhere that uh, Driscoll was anything other than faithful to his wife Grace. Um, all people can seem to testify to the relative health of their marriage. There was no financial misdeed doing, at least that I'm aware of, but instead Driscoll's collapse and the cl collapse of the Mars Hill church enterprise, whatever we want to call that thing, uh, seems to be character related. His temper, his fury, the way that he treated people, and so he fell as a pastor for quite different reasons than we normally hear about people falling from their positions of leadership. Now, if you're tuning into this video and you're not, you, you, if you're not familiar with this channel, maybe you're new to this channel, and you're hoping that I'm gonna do some smear merchanting today and I'm really just gonna bash on Driscoll or conversely bash on the opponents of Driscoll, you're gonna be very disappointed because I don't do that on this channel. Um, I don't use these kinds of topics in order to name drop and kind of smash people's reputations. I'm not interested in that kind of stuff. So you'll have to go elsewhere if you do want to get that kind of content. But I do want to take a moment to welcome you to this channel. My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We are a Presbyterian church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're anywhere in the vicinity of Butler, Cranberry, Historic Saxonburg, or the Steel City itself, come check us out at some point. Gospel Fellowship PCA in Valencia, Pennsylvania. We have three services, 8.30, 11, and 4 o'clock p.m. All right. Uh, also, if you're unfamiliar, I am a Jonathan Edwards scholar and a writer from Modern Reformation Online. So there's the welcome to the channel. Now, I will have to admit to you, rather frankly, that I liked Driscoll quite a bit when I was younger. I'm about 45 years old right now. When I was in my late 20s, early 30s, I thought Driscoll was really, really cool. I will stop short of using the word fandom because I don't believe that Christians should be fans of other Christian leaders. I think that's part of the problem of the collapse of this particular church as uh, those who listen to the podcast, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, will undoubtedly discover, if you don't know that already. Um, love Driscoll. I thought his preaching was sharp. I thought it was clever. 
uh, laughed a lot. A lot of his preaching is very funny if you listen to it. It's also very tough. He uses a lot of tough language, particularly against men. Um, and then, and actually, that's part of his ethos is how hard he preached to men, challenging them to rise up and be godly men, fathers, husbands, and workers, and things like that. Of course, I had quite a bit of tolerance in my heart for Mark Driscoll, at least during the heyday, because he uh, he drew himself out as a Calvinist. In fact, Driscoll commonly cycled with such people as John Piper, uh, D.A. Carson, Matt Chandler, others that were tied to the young, restless, reformed movement. If you're Presbyterian, none of those guys are going to strike you as particularly reformed, and there's some question about the young and reformed and restless uh, movement for whatever that was anyways. That seems to be on the outs. Uh, nevertheless, confessionalism still drives forward as we have for 500 years or so. But I really kind of fell out of favor with Driscoll as far as listening to his stuff and reading any of his content when he then changed his mind again and decided that the five points of Calvinism were garbage as he said so on June uh, 2019 on the debrief show a podcast apparently hosted by some guy called Matt Brown who I've never otherwise heard of and so when he began to disparage the very Calvinism that kind of helped him to crest the wave and gain an audience I was like, that's it, I'm off the Driscoll train. And as, as much as I did appreciate some of his preaching, particularly to men um, and some of his more expository stuff, such as it was, um, I totally, totally unboarded with the five points are garbage comment. In fact, I even got rid of his books. Before that, I had read several of his, uh, several of his books. But I want to ask a question today. I'm not here to smear merchant, I promise. I really don't want to do that. I don't want to bash. I don't want to gossip. I don't know any of the people personally that we're discussing today, so I need to be careful. But I do want to ask a question. The question is, what if Driscoll had been a Presbyterian? Um, what if he had had in his life both confessional and ecclesiastical guardrails. Could he have kept the train on the track, so to speak? Would he have had enough accountability in his life to continue preaching the gospel, growing the church, planting churches, speaking at conferences, etc.? So what we're going to do today is, is kind of alt, uh, enter into an alternate universe. Now, I don't believe in the multiverse theory or anything like that, but it does really make you wonder. Have you ever wondered something like, gosh, I wonder if this one factor were different, would the rest of history as it played out had been had been any different? And in my case, I can't help but wonder as I listen to this podcast and think about Mark Driscoll's gifts and talents, what would have happened if he had been Presbyterian? So we're going to try to follow that line of thought today and just see where it where it might have taken us. You know, I think everybody who got into Driscoll, whether they hated him or whether they loved him, could recognize that there was some real talent there. There was some real giftedness. And by all accounts, and I'm thankful that the Christianity Today podcast does substantiate this, people's lives were really, really, truly changed by the gospel at Mars Hill. Whatever, whatever else you want to say about Mars Hill, people came to Jesus, got baptized, got married, and had true encounters with the great and living God through the preaching of Mars Hill and, in particular, Mark Driscoll. So we don't want to denigrate any of that. People had a real, true encounter with Christ. This is not a cult, as cults are defined. Driscoll did not set up a new more, uh, you know, Mormonism or a new Jehovah's Witnesses movement or something that left Christianity entirely. But by all accounts, Mars Hill was an evangelical and, for the most part, reformed-ish church in which people met Jesus, got saved, read their Bibles, and uh, tried to live godly lives. So uh, we're, not, we're not questioning these things, the experiences of the people that went to Mars Hill, but we are asking the question, it's a theoretical question, what if Driscoll had, instead of going his own way on every single turn, what if he had been Presbyterian? So the first question we're going to ask is, would Driscoll have even been ordained could he have been ordained? And of course, the answer to that is, well, no, he couldn't have been ordained, at least as he would have originally presented himself. Now, what we know about Driscoll, and you can find a lot of this online, even Wikipedia will tell you that Driscoll um, had a bachelor's degree in communications from Washington State University. 
Um, people that knew Driscoll tell us that he was pretty smart. He was uh, voted the most likely to succeed in his high school class. Uh, people recognized his abilities in terms of his cognitive performance. He was very sharp. He could read. He even bragged he could read a book a day, which I don't know that anybody can actually do that unless you're reading really small books. Um, but with his communication skills, he was a, a very competent preacher and presenter. In fact, a lot of my early preaching, I tried to emulate not so much his crass style. I never really got into that. But I liked how Driscoll would step out from the pulpit and preach with his Bible in his hand and just talk to the people. I found that to be very, very effective. He's not a note reader. He wasn't a manuscripting guy, although he seems to have a large set of notes when he at least prepares. But he would not have been able to be ordained as such without having to go through some very rigorous training. And not only that, but if he was going to be a church planter, which is what Mars Hill was, it was a church plant, he would have had to go through, at least if he was Presbyterian, the church planting assessment training or something like that. Not, not every church planter in the PCA has to go through church planting assessment, but many of them do. And one of the real values of church planting assessments, and there are some weaknesses as well, I'm, I'm sure, is that it helps to identify some of the character issues that may ultimately be problematic when it comes to church planting. Perhaps some of his uh, hyper belligerence, some of his lack of patience, some of, uh, of his uh, fury, his temper might have been identified and perhaps even corrected to some degree. But certainly Driscoll would have had to go to seminary first before he could have planted the church. Now, as he tells the story, in his own words, he was never uh, ordained by any group. He never was even a member of a church. And so, therefore, he thought himself perfectly qualified to plant the church. Well, no, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. But in our alternate universe that we're crafting here today, where would Driscoll have gone to seminary? Well, there would be a couple of options out there on the West Coast. Uh, you might think about Fuller Theological Seminary or something like that, that I'm not sure what kind of education he would have gotten if he had come out at Fuller. But let's say, for the sake of our hypothetical, that Driscoll went all the way down to Westminster Theological Seminary in Escondido, California. And why not? This is my <laughs> theoretical discussion here anyway. So I'm going to suggest in my alternate universe that Driscoll goes to Westminster in Escondido. Who would he have studied under there? Well, Driscoll would have studied under men like Michael Horton, Robert Godfrey, R. Scott Clark, David Van Drunen. In other words, Driscoll would have come out of Westminster with a world-class reformed education. And I could only guess that that would have served him very, very well. If Driscoll had gone to Westminster, it's likely that he would have either gone into the United Reformed Church with uh, Horton and R. Scott Clark and some of those guys, or let's just say he would have gone into the PCA. Either way, he would have come out of seminary with one of two convictions. Either he'd be a three forms of unity guy, and he'd have the Belgic Confession, Heidelberg Catechism, and the Canons of Dort to guide his theology and his practice, or he would have come out as a Presbyterian and had the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms as his confessional guides. Either way, Driscoll would have come out a lot more theologically solid and prepared than having simply gone into ministry as a communications major. Because what happened to Driscoll, of course, is that he ended up steering Mars Hill wherever he wanted it to go. And you can't do that when you're Reformed, when you're truly Reformed. And that's one of the differences between the young, rest and restless, and Reformed movement and true confessionalism is there is much more, uh, you know, I want to say, um, uh, what's the right word for this? stridency, structure, um, a sure path. <laughs> um, so here's the problem with Driscoll. He, he did what he wanted, right? He was one day emergent, and then he's reformed, and then one day he's charismatic. And Driscoll drove that church wherever he wanted to drive it at the moment. And in some sense, Driscoll was very good at riding whatever wave was popular at the time. There was a day in which emergent church theology was very, very hip and cool. And Driscoll rode that bus as far as it would go. And then there was a day when the young, restless, and reformed movement was in full bloom. And, of course, Driscoll was there, too. 
ultimately when he found himself out of sorts with those groups he went to the charismatic direction of course when you're receiving dreams and visions from the Lord you can basically do whatever you want to do now it's true that Driscoll cited dreams and visions throughout his ministry to direct his course in certain poignant moments of his decision making but that sort of thing I had a dream or I saw a vision or an angel spoke to me or I heard a voice from heaven that sort of thing doesn't play very well when you are restrained and restricted by the confessional documents of a true reformed upbringing so if he had gone to Westminster and had come out reformed he would not have been able to use continuationism as a legitimacy for some of the directions that he chose to take the church he would not have been able to play the God told me to do this card. Um, there's one moment, actually several in Driscoll's history where he does this, to quite great disappointment. One of them is towards the later end of his time at Mars Hill, where the church was finally calling him into account for some of his action, actions, uh, the way he was treating people, the way he was yelling at people, verbally abusing them and whatnot. And uh, they're doing this work of this assessment, considering these charges against him. And Driscoll ends up resigning, right? You know the story. And it's then that he says that God told him in a dream that there was a trap that had been set, set for him. Now, what trap? Well, of course, he just used this as a legitimation to his for his desire to resign. He didn't want to face the charges. And so, ultimately, he used his continuationism as a methodology for escaping difficult moments in his decision-making uh, uh, course. Not only that, but if he was going to be ordained PCA or in a reformed denomination, he would have had to go through an internship before he could have planted a church or become a pastor. In our church book of order, a person needs some ministerial experience before we thrust them into the, the bright lights and the great challenges and stresses of pastoral leadership. And if Driscoll would have gone through a recognizable internship of some course, some kind, he might have had some of these character issues discovered very early on and perhaps been able to work on them. One of the benefits of going through an internship as you're preparing for ordination is that you have a mentor and it's very interesting, I was listening to episode four on my way to work this morning, how there are very few real mentors in Driscoll's life. As he tells his story of conversion, he once or twice mentions a person of real pastoral authority in his life, but those people seem to come and go very, very quickly and very often are used as counterexamples for what not to do. And so Driscoll doesn't really have that father, brother sort of mentor ever in his pastoral ministry. And so instead he sets himself up as the father brother mentor to many other people and i think that could have been corrected so what would have happened in this alternate universe if he was presbyterian is he wouldn't have gotten ordained and he wouldn't have been able to plant mars hill quite as early as he did now let's suppose that he eventually ends up planting mars hill anyways which would have been a wonderful thing but instead of doing it in 1996 he would have been delayed at least by four to five years by going through an internship and working through seminary to 2001. And what that does is it takes his age from 26 to 31. Now, by the time Mark Driscoll was 27 years old, he was already leading and speaking in major conferences because Mars Hill had grown so quickly that conferences from all over the United States were tapping him as guest speaker, guru, and expert in church growth. That by the time he's 27 years old. But if he wasn't ordained until the time he was 31 years old, he would not have had all of that pressure to become this guru, to present himself as this expert guru that he ended up presenting himself. And that's part of the reason why he ended up feeling so pressured that he had to take such an authoritarian stance in many ways, crushing many people along the path and Mark would commonly say things like on the Mars Hill bus you can either get on or get off or get out of the way and get crushed and in fact a lot of people did get crushed as he led it with this domineering personality style he wouldn't have been able to do that now another stricture another restraint let's say another seat belt perhaps would have been a real elder board so in our scenario uh, Mark instead of planting Mars Hill in 1996 
is delayed by five years. He also ages five years. He's five years more mature. And when he plants Mars Hill, instead of creating an ecclesiology out of thin air, Mark would have inherited the ecclesiastical structures that Presbyterianism has used for centuries. That is to say, he would have had an elder board. Now, what Mark did at Mars Hill basically is make it up as he went. He didn't know how to lead a church. Uh, he didn't know how to design a church. Should the pastor be the head man in charge with a, a tree of responsibility following under him? Or should it be the uh, prophet, priest, king thing where they set up, at, at least at one point in Mars Hill's history, they had... Uh, one person who's the prophet, one person who's the priest or the carrying pastor, another person who's the king, who's the or, the administration guy. Well, they made that up. Uh, they used biblical examples, biblical typology, even the offices of Christ as uh, a, a justification for that. But where else had that been tried in church history? We have three men in charge of the church, one prophet, one priest, and one king. Well, they made that up as they're flying by the seat of their pants. But if he had been Presbyterian, he would have assumed he would have gone into the ecclesiastical structure of the elder board, which, as I mentioned, Presbyterian churches have been using for centuries to great effect. And not only that, but Driscoll, rather than seeing himself as the visionary leader, uh, the, the bold man who steps forth, uh, the John the Baptist, I do it my way sort of character, instead he would have been one elder amongst other elders. See, in Presbyterianism, of course, you already know this if you're Presbyterian, we have teaching elders and we have ruling elders. So teaching elders are the pastors and the ruling elders fill out the rest of the session. Men that have other jobs, other callings, other careers, but they're ordained nevertheless. And when you walk into the session room as a pastor, you are not the leader of all of your elders as though you're up here and they're down here. It doesn't work that way. No, no. When you're Presbyterian... Even the pastor is one elder amongst the brotherhood of elders. In fact, when we go to a presbytery meeting or we go to the general assembly, we refer to each other as brothers and fathers. Nobody is the rock star in such settings. Nobody is the CEO in such settings. Nobody is uh, the king or the chief of the tribe in such settings. When you're Presbyterian and you're a pastor, you're the teaching elder, you are one elder among the brothers. And Driscoll would have had to learn that the hard way. Now, I'm not saying that his boorish, brash, strong personality, which served him very well in other regards, wouldn't have kicked against that structure, but he would have inherited a structure that would have served him well had he had accountability from the very beginning. Now, in my theoretical question, I would certainly not deny that Driscoll would have had his gifts and his preaching, um, his uh, photographic memory, his ability to speak freely off the cuff, humorously, with great wit, and at, at times, very profound wisdom. In fact, when I look at Mars Hill, um, it does strike me what incredible vision Mark Driscoll had for growing a church in an ungodly city like Seattle. I mean, how many people could do that? Not a lot of people. Not a lot of people could pull off what Mark Driscoll was able to do. And so he would have certainly still had those expository gifts in the pulpit, those preaching gifts, those teaching gifts, and those vision gifts. And those w would have, I think, served him very well. However, the strictures and the restraints of Presbyterianism would have provided for slower growth over the time. He would not have been able to so quickly plant churches all over the place, but I do think that Mars Hill would have seen slower growth but steadier growth and therefore might still be there to this very day. Now having fellow elders instead of employees to terrify, I think Driscoll's rougher edges of his personality would have been restrained and some of his better gifts would have been able to, uh, to have withstood some of the turmoil that Mars Hill went through. But let's just say in our theoretical that Mark Driscoll's personality nevertheless still ruffled some feathers. I think that would have been inevitable. Let's just say he would have got himself into some personality conflicts. I think that still would have been inevitable. I'm not suggesting that an elder board eliminates personality conflicts. and In fact, sometimes it creates them. But supposing that he had been Presbyterian, 
what would have happened next? So these charges of character or temper or lashing out or verbal abuse come to Mark Driscoll. What would have happened? Well, unfortunately, as happens so many times in megachurch non-denominational structures, there's no backup for when chaos happens. The bylaws never anticipate that a church is going to go off into a terrible a crisis of spiraling downhill, as Mars Hill did. And so what happens is they sometimes have to make it up as they go. Sometimes they have to get nonprofit reconciliation ministries involved. Sometimes they have to get, you know, some sort of a mediation counseling involved. Um, but in Presby world, we already have a fallback built in because we've been doing this for hundreds of years. The Presbytery would have been able to identify the crisis and sent the ministerial committee to the church to help. Uh, they would have had some true accountability. There would have been methods to ferret through some of the difficulties that were being experienced amongst the personalities. They would not have had to make up reconciliatory systems as they go. And I think Mars Hill might have been able to weather the storm that ultimately caused its collapse. One other problem that we have to mention, though, is the personality cult issue. Uh, Mark famously preached a sermon or a message or a staff meeting lecture, something like this, called his I Am the Brand speech, where Mark talks how uh, closely the branding of Mars Hill is tied to his own personal branding as a leader. And of course, in Presbyterianism, that's very, very hard if not impossible to do. Now, I'm not saying that you could never create a personality cult in Presbyterian systems and structures. But it's very, very hard to do so. And one of the reasons is because from day one, nobody is recognized as the smartest man in the room, the genius with unquestionable leadership. In fact, in Presbyterianism, we commonly sharpen each other by questioning, questioning and challenging each other such that it's very, very difficult to set up any kind of pres uh, personality cult. I don't think Mark's I am the brand shtick would have worked at all in a presbytery. Um, many of us, when we go to presbytery meetings or general assembly, we're actually intimidated by how wise and sharp the fellow elders are. I mean, when you're the smartest man in the room, it's pretty, pretty easy to manipulate people. And I think a lot of a lot of us could do that. But when you go into a presbytery and everybody in the room is equally as educated, as trained, as sharp, uh, this guy's a Hebrew scholar, this guy's a Greek scholar, uh, this guy's got an outstanding ministry, and, and this guy's incredibly wise over here, and this guy's a college professor, and this guy's a seminary professor, and you realize like you're swimming in, in talent, and skill and ability and every single person in the room is equally as qualified as you are pretty tough to dominate that room and set up any kind of personality cult I don't think Driscoll would have been able to do that in a Presbyterian system or else it would have been very very hard and not only that but when Mars Hill set up its satellite churches and satellite campuses one of the things that it did is try to maintain Driscoll's authority over the brand. In other words, what did they do? They listened to his sermons on video. That would not work in Presbyterian systems because we work, uh, we believe in the word and sacrament ministry, which means that we would rather have other pastors and teachers in our churches. And uh, we wouldn't have been able to capitalize then on that kind of branding mentality where and Andy, Andy Stanley and other churches use this. I'm not a big fan, to be completely honest. These satellite campuses where they have a live band or whatever, maybe a pastor who is kind of the leader of that particular campus. But then what happens after the worship time is the screens roll down and you see a, a video recorded or live message from the pastor of the main campus. I, that would not work in Presbyterianism because of our theology of the word and the sacrament. We truly believe that the power of, is in the word, not the personality of the man. And so setting up satellite campuses would have been, I think, doomed to failure in Presbyterian systems. So in my alternate universe, what happens with Mark Driscoll and Mars Hill? Well, I predict that if he were Presbyterian, he still would have been very successful. 
He would have had far more accountability, however, in his personality, in his leadership. He would not have been able to use his continuationist dreams and visions to substantiate some of his decisions. But I do think he would have had a fairly successful role in church planting in the Northwest, and perhaps Mars Hill would still be intact with Mark serving as some sort of expert in church planting even to this day. One of the ironies is that Mark Driscoll had the vision to help set up the Acts 29 church planting network, which did a lot of wonderful things. But Acts 29 church planting network ended up kicking out Mars Hill and its founder from their network, a deep and painful irony. Perhaps Driscoll would have been able to use some of his skills in other ways had he had the structure and the strictures of Presbyterianism. Anyways, thanks for watching this video, um, an alternate universe presentation, of course. Driscoll is a Presbyterian, but one wonders what would have happened if he had been. By the way, I just want to recommend, this is my little book here called Unknown, The Extraordinary Influence of Ordinary Christians. I do mention Driscoll very briefly at the beginning. The point of this book is how you don't have to be a famous celebrity preacher to be significant. Uh, what I do in this book is I give several Bible studies of some of the lesser known people in the book of Acts that surrounded the Apostle Paul. Uh, some people like Ananias and Epaphroditus and Lydia, some of these other lesser knowns. And I talk about how they too greatly impacted the world for the glory of Christ, though they were not famous and well known. If you're watching today, you don't need to be Mark Driscoll. You don't need to be famous. You don't need to have a brand or anything like that. You just need to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, thank you so much for watching this brief video. Hope it challenged you. Do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.